Okay. Um, what I want to start off with today is to talk a little bit about um, sort of a broader issue, and I think this is an issue that we'll sort of we'll come back to with each of the other talks. But I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of dogs. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about cats. The reason that that's tucked at the end is we don't know nearly as much about cats' evolution and behavioral genetics as we do about dogs. Given that it's a huge field and we only have uh, 50 minutes or so, a little bit about the genetics of dog disease and behavior. And what I really want to do is give you more of an idea, not about all the details, of which there's many now, but about how we approach it, how we, how we quantify these sorts of things, and how we, uh, how we deal with this kind of information, not so much about the specific you know, markers and things like that. Uh, and I want to tie this together then with uh, what I call an ethological approach to behavior. And, and this is a, a very modern kind of approach where we take what we know about the genetics of a behavior, what we know about the ecology and learning component of a behavior, and we put that together. And to demonstrate that, I want to talk a little bit about an example where we're going to talk about evolution, we're going to talk about the principles of dog evolution, the behavioral genetics, and yet also the environment, and bring that together in sort of a modern uh, uh, presentation. And the example I'll use is on social hierarchies, the whole leader of the pack uh, controversy that's out there right now. At the end, we'll put in a little bit about cats. Uh, there's some interesting things coming out with cats, but much less than, so that won't take uh, nearly as long. So that's sort of the roadmap. That's where I want to try and go with this first presentation today. So let's talk a little bit about um, dog evolution. And the first thing we now know, which we actually didn't conclusively until about three years ago, is that dogs are clearly evolved from gray wolves. There's been a controversy for decades about the evolution of dogs and sort of a multiple source evolution of dogs and did dogs in different continents evolve from some from fox or some from wild dogs or some from wolves or some, you know. So we could have a multiple source of, of dogs on an evolutionary scale. And we now know very conclusively that all domestic dogs, everything we know of as a domestic dog has evolved from a Eurasian wolf stock. Uh, this is a nice review paper, again, by Parker and Ostrander at Fred Hutch. Um, 360 genetic diseases also found in humans are found in dogs. 46% of those diseases, the genetic diseases also found in humans, occur in only one or a very few breeds. Okay? And all of these diseases are clearly cataloged at this website uh, at Cambridge in the UK. Very nice website for genetic diseases. And you can search by breed, you can just search by disease type, you can search by genetic mutation type, and so on. It's a, a research database, but fascinating to kind of browse through, okay? But the point is that 46% of these diseases occur in only very few breeds. Why? And the why, which again is something we're gonna come back and talk about later, is inbreeding. Well, you can go to the literature, and you start looking at the literature, and you find very, very similar values. The studies that I was able to pull up fairly easily now are in Spitz, English Setters, somebody studied Whippets, somebody studied, everybody studied German Shepherds, and you get almost exactly the same values. You tend to get heritabilities for these specific behaviors between 14 and 20 percent, okay? Which in the genetics world is important. I mean, there are heritabilities of 15 you know, to 20% for a lot of genetic diseases uh, and things like that. I mean, the, the, the heritability for breast cancer, which we all know they've identified a gene for breast cancer, the heritability for, for breast cancer is, is lower than 15%. Jump ahead here. There we go. Okay. The second principle, of course, is that there are environmental influences, ex learning, environmental influences that are overlaid on what we call genetic predispositions. So now we know that there are different genetic predispositions in different breeds, and we have to lay on top of that what happens to them, how they're reared, how they're socialized, confrontational training techniques, as I'll talk about in my second talk today, right? So there's learning, obviously very important, remember? Only, what, 30 to at best 50% of the variability in these trait, behavioral traits was heritable. The rest must be environment and learning and and development and, and all that sort of thing. 